Okay, so welcome everyone to the session. Uh, today we're going to kick off with our first webinar in the seminar series on research and culture, learning and technology. I'm Dr. Nicola Pallet from the University of Cape Town. Uh, and today I'd just like to tell you a bit more um, about the Culture, Learning and Technology Division. Some of you may know that Emerge Africa became affiliated with the AECT, Association for Educational Communications and Technology, last year. And if you'd like to know more about that, I'm going to share the link with you here. But I went to the AECT convention last year where I met folks from this wonderful division called the Culture, Learning and Technology Division, of which Angela Benson is the president. I'm going to share some bio info with you now on our presenters for today. So we've got um, Associate Professor Angela Benson, who is from the University of Alabama in the US. And she's published more than 40 academic uh, publications. She's also the co-editor of the book that we're giving away as a um, four competition prizes uh, during these webinar series. And as I mentioned, she's also the president of the Culture, Learning, and Technology Division of AECT. We also have Deepak um, Sabramoni. Um, apologies if I didn't say that right. And he's Associate Professor and Coordinator of Educational Technology Graduate Program at Kansas State University College of Education. And we also have Lachelle. And Lachelle is Assistant Professor of Computer Science at Coppin State University in Baltimore. Uh, and all of these presenters have chapters in the book that Angela is going to be telling you more about. So I'm going to hand over to you, Angela. Thank you, Nicola, and uh, thanks to everyone who's in attendance this morning. I just want to welcome you again to the part one of the two-part webinar series on research and culture learning and technology. And I'm going to say thank you for being with us this morning. It's probably not morning where everybody is, but it's 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning here in Alabama in the U.S. So I consider this a very important session since I'm up so early in the morning and actually talking. <laughs> so uh, uh, Nicola gave you some background on who we are. So I'm just going to repeat a little bit of that and then we'll move forward. We are the editor, the, your presenters, are editors and authors of the recently published book, Cultural Learning and Technology, Research and pra Practice. Most of us are members of the Cultural Learning and Technology Division, but not all of us. Uh, in the book, we had AEC team members as well as people who were not AEC team members. Um, I was fortunate enough, as Nicola said, to meet her at last year's AECT convention in Las Vegas, which was in the U.S., and I hope to meet more of you at the upcoming convention, which is going to be in Jacksonville, Florida, also in the U.S. So what we hope to do during this two-part webinar series is to share with you some of the insights we gained during the development of the book. Um, the slide says there will be four of us presenting this morning, but it looks like there will only be three. So you can count. One of us is just missing this morning. Uh, I'll leave each person, if they would like, to give a more detailed introduction of themselves. I just want to clarify one thing that Nicola said. She said I was the president of the Cultural Learning and Technology Division. Well, I just want to make clear that I am the outgoing president, which means that at this year's uh, convention in Jacksonville, I will officially become the past president. And if you've ever been president of an organization or a group, you know it's a lot more fun to be past president than it is to be president. Um, so what I'm going to do as one of the editors of the Cultural Learning and Technology book is to give you an overview of the book and of today's session. If you have any questions, um, do we hold them to the end, Nicola, or do they get to put them in the chat box? How do we want to do that? 
I'm happy to collect them for you, and then um, we can, what, whenever you, you feel is most appropriate, either point in your presentation or at the end. Which would you prefer? Okay, probably at the, probably at the end, unless I can see them as we go. Yeah. Okay, that's what we'll do. Okay, let's start at the beginning with some definitions. What do we mean by culture learning and technology? What does culture mean to you? At this point, we're going to try for a little interaction. You are welcome to enter some terms in the chat box if you want to engage with me and tell me about your definition of culture and what it means to you. It would be very interesting to hear from you if you're interested in sharing your thoughts. Um, in the book and in our work, we take a very broad view of culture. Okay, we have multiple attendees of typing. That's a good sign. Thank you for participating. Hmm, culture is about me and my society. Great answer. Great comment. Beliefs and practices of a group of people. Another great comment. Um, there was one definition of culture that I really liked, and you don't have to try to remember this. We will actually provide you some resources to everything that we talk about today so that you can uh, further explore the ideas and concepts that we present. Okay. Culture is a set of basic assumptions and values, orientations to life, beliefs, policies, procedures, and conventions that are shared by a group of people and that influence their behavior and how they interpret the meaning of other people's behavior. That's one of my favorite uh, definitions. And I think the definitions that you shared, see there's Tony's ways of engaging with people or things that are specific to a particular group. Uh, your answers are, are excellent. Um, if you look at the culture umbrella image, you see a lot of um, topics fall under culture, religion, gender, age socioeconomic status, generation, and there are, also things, there are also some things that don't fall under culture. For example, we don't see school culture in this, under this umbrella, but we consider school culture culture as we consider all organizational culture. Ooh, you guys have better answers than I do for what culture is. Maybe you should be giving the presentation. Hmm, culture is in part the ideas that are normalized from such a long, young age that they seem inherent and natural. Hmm. Thank you. So our view of culture is very, very broad, and it encompasses everything under the umbrella and everything that you share. And so broad definitions are good for some people, and they're not so good for other people. But we went broad. So the next thing, and I'll ask you to chime in on this one as well, is what does learning mean to you? You're welcome to enter some terms in the chat box again. In our book and in our work, we take a very broad view of learning just as we did of culture. Uh, discovering and applying new facts and behaviors. Great. Thank you, Lachelle. Learning equals being able to do something you couldn't do before. I love it, Anna. Learning is transformation of capabilities to think and act. Hey, and you're all doing this without a book. This is pretty impressive. It means we're all very smart. Learning. I'm just waiting to see what else is going to be written. So we take a very broad view of learning. And it, 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 it captures everything that, that you've written. It's a change in attitude, skills, and knowledge as a result of experience, study, or being taught. It can be formal or informal, intentional or, or, or 
incidental in the classroom or at home. All kinds of learning falls under our umbrella of learning. Learning is, in, is a journey involves knowing, being, and doing. Thank you, Nicole. Now, of course, the next question is, what does technology mean to you? Once again, you can give us some terms in the chat box so we can interact a bit. And as you can guess, uh, we take a very broad view of technology. Okay, not so many technology answers. Well, typically when we think about technology, the first thing that we think of, think about are the technology products of the toys that we use. Uh, in the image, you see the laptops, the, the mobile devices. You see the film strips, the slide projectors, email. You see the microphones. Um, as, let's see, what, what does Lachelle say? Electronic tools that en enable and enhance communication, entertainment, learning, and all aspects of life. Uh, Nicola, tools I have access to in my context that I can use to support me to craft meaningful learning experiences, but also for leisure. Gosh, that's a great answer. Technology that you always had is invisible to you. Hmm, excellent insight. There's a great quote from Douglas Adams that technology is anything invented after you were born. Tools and technology can be synonymous. Oh, great, great answer. So, and I think some of you sort of alluded to it, but when we think about the product technologies, we think about the tools and artifacts, the media, which most people recognize as technology. But... In our work, we also include process technology in our definition. Process technologies includes the strategies, models, and methods that guide the design and development of instruction and the use of product technologies. So can you provide some examples of process technologies? I think a couple of you alluded to some in your uh, uh, description of technology. So what are some process technologies? from your perspective. I have to tell you that I'm from Alabama in the United States. And that's referred to as the South. And I have been told that I have a Southern accent, which means, I don't know, if I say that I sound country, does that mean anything to anybody other than me? But you'll notice in the three of us that we all have different accents. My accent is characterized as a Southern accent. And when you hear Deepak and Lachelle, you will notice that uh, their uh, accent is very different than mine. Okay, so Michelle says instructional strategies guide the curricula. Uh, Tony, learning, uh, instructional design, facilitation processes, video editor. Now, I think that's more uh, a product technology. Hmm. Michelle says she's northern. I, you, you, you get the ideas of process technology, instructional design models, instructional strategies, learning theory, specifically something like Gagne's nine events of instruction and Bloom's taxonomy. Those are just a few of uh, examples of process technologies. When we talk about cultural learning and te technology, we are talking about the intersection of these three areas. A lot of work is being done in culture, a lot of work is being done in learning, and a lot of work is being done in technology. But we are looking at work that's being done at the intersection of these three areas.
This leads to our next question. What kinds of research is being conducted at the intersection of culture, learning, and technology? That is a question we began to answer in our book. We don't think our answer is the only answer. Rather, we consider it one answer. As we do more work, our understanding of culture, learning, and technology increases, and the terms become better defined. We answered the question with the categories of chapters that we included in the book. While I will discuss the chapters as though they belong to a single category, it should be noted that some chapters can be associated with multiple categories. First, we included three chapters that use critical perspectives to argue for equity and inclusion in educational technology research and practice. This work basically critiques the status quo and challenges us to do better. The frameworks that guide this work can be characterized as critical frameworks. They allow us to answer questions such as who is included, who is excluded, whose interests are represented, whose interests are marginalized. This work also begins to provide strategies for disrupting inequalities and inequities. The critical perspective moves beyond challenging dominant ideologies or worldviews. It is about defining and identifying instances, methods, and processes of learning that are specific to individual group, groups. Critical pedagogy, cultural diversity, and critical theory were the frameworks used in the three critical perspectives chapter. In chapter two, Amy Bradshaw, who will present next week, uses critical pedagogy as a lens to critique educational technology. Critical pedagogy encompasses educational approaches that are focused on empowering learners, addressing issues directly and immediately relevant to learners, and seeking to transform systems and structures that contribute to oppression and marginalization. In chapter three, uh, Deepak, Deepak, who's going to present uh, immediately after me, uh, viewed the history of the field of instructional technology through the lens of cultural diversity. In his case, cultural diversity refers to differences based on culture, nationality, race, ethnicity, language, and religion. Um, in Chapter 4, Michael Thomas, who will be with you next week, argues that in this current age of globalization, we need a critical theory of technology to help us to examine and critique the products and systems that we as educational technologists design, develop, and implement. Such a theory would allow for an ongoing self-critique that should help us to that should lead us to more equ equitable practice within the field. The second category of cultural learning and technology research that we included in the book were chapters describing research that employs culture-based frameworks to explore and describe various learning situations and settings. We only began to stretch to stretch the surface of these frameworks in the book. So we are planning a second book that more fully explores these frameworks. Intercultural sensitivity, cultural competency, Hofstede's cultural dimensions, and cultural responsive pedagogy were the frameworks used in the culture-based frameworks chapter. I'm sure that you've heard of uh, some of these frameworks so I'll just give you a brief overview of them. And what we're also going to do is provide some resources, and Nicola can tell us where, so that you can go back and explore these in more detail at a later time. In Chapter 6 in the book, Joe Tarantino, who was scheduled to be with us this morning, but who had a personal issue that, that prevented him from attending, used Bennett's developmental model of intercultural sensitivity to assess the intercultural sensitivity in university students enrolled in an online learning model. Intercultural sensitivity is the ability to discriminate and experience relevant cultural differences. People who can do this are considered to have an 
intercultural worldview. Bennett's stages of intercultural sensitivity go from denial to defense reversal to minimization to acceptance to adoption and finally to integration. In Chapter 9, uh, Sandra Young and her colleagues explored the development of cultural competency using social media tools in informal le learning settings. Generally speaking, cultural competency represents a respect and sensitivity to the diversity of individuals and groups from different cultural and religious settings. Uh, in a lot of the research, you'll see uh, cultural competency and intercultural sensitivity used almost interchangeably. In Chapter 7, Bodie Anderson, who is going to be here next week, examines Japanese students' experience in distance learning. In his work, he used Hofstede's cultural dimensions to, oper to operationalize uh, culture. If you are familiar with that model, you know that you know it has six dimensions: um, individual versus collectivism, power distance, uncertainty avoidance, masculinity versus femininity, indulgence versus restraint, and long-term versus short-term orientation. And once again, you aren't expected to remember any of this. We can, we will provide resources for you. Uh, Lachelle, who's on the session with us, will present today. In her chapter, she used the tenets of culturally relevant pedagogy to teach computational thinking and computer programming to African American students. Culturally relevant pedagogy is defined as using the knowledge, prior experiences, frames of references, and performance styles of eth ethnically diverse students to make learning more relevant and effective. So it's... Oops. It's just as the title says, culturally relevant pedagogy. In Chapter 10, Roberto Joseph integrates culturally relevant pedagogy with game-based learning to help underrepresented students in middle and high school master STEM content, where STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And then finally, the third category of cultural learning and technology research that we included in the book were chapters presenting case studies and research that provide platforms for the voices and experiences of people and groups underrepresented or marginalized in uh, education and education research. This work allows us to apply existing models to these populations in order to learn more about the populations and to identify shortcomings in the models many of which don't account for culture. Uh, three of the chapters in this category features voices of populations underrepresented in education research. These include Chinese international college students, Australian secondary students, and African American secondary students. Um, chapter 12, Zaydao Gao uses a unified theory of technology acceptance and use to explore Chinese international students' use of mobile learning which is important in the U.S. since uh, Chinese international students are the largest uh, category, largest population, the fastest growing population of international students. Uh, in Chapter 5, Akisha Horton, who will be here next week, explores the design and delivery of a global hip-hop course for Australian secondary students. Uh, this work could also be categorized as critical. Ooh, I apologize. Um, could also be categorized as critical since it uses uh, critical cosmopolitan theory as a framework. And she will tell you more about what that is. And then we had Netta Khalili, who presented a project to increase science learning in African American students, mostly boys from aging from, for ages 12 to 16. So these chapters just give voices to voices that aren't typically heard in the education literature. And our final two chapters could actually be in another category, but we kept them in this category. Um, in one of the chapters, chapter 11, Xu Long Yang uh, uses boy culture as a lens to investigate the current crisis in boys' education. They posit that boys are underperforming and dropping out from formal education and argue that video games have the potential to re-engage them back in school. 
And then our last chapter looked at school culture versus the political culture around the schools and how those work together to influence what happens in the school. This chapter reminds us that technology adoption and usage in schools exist in a cultural co context that public school stakeholders often overlook. So even though we don't want to talk about culture and the roles that it plays, and sometimes we try to say that it doesn't, it's always there. And that's what that chapter shows. So where do we go next? Our book stretched the surface of the approaches to cultural learning and technology research. So what's next? Our next publication will look more deeply at the different publications that can, the different frameworks that can be used to study CLT. And I'm going to step aside now and allow Deepak and uh, Lachelle to present in detail their chapters. And as I said before, we will provide links to resources so that you can further explore the content that we've provided. Uh, we're also going to give away two free books, and the rest of you will be able to purchase the book if you're interested at a 20% discount. So thank you. All right, good morning, good afternoon. I hope everybody can hear me, and I hope uh, the connection is good enough that it's all clear. Uh, my name is Deepak Subramani. Uh, I am an associate professor of educational technology at Kansas State University, as Nicola introduced me. And Nicola pronounced my name better than most of my American colleagues do, so I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal background. I was born and raised in India, and I moved to the U.S. when I was 24 years old, which is a long time ago. And uh, I've been in this country ever since. I finally became a U.S. citizen in 2015, just before Donald Trump became president. So I have kind of mixed feelings about that. So apart from that, uh, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I feel like I must be driving to the airport or something because that's the only reason why I'm usually up at 6 a.m., except that I'm here yeah, here with all of y'all. So uh, glad to be here. So let's get started. I'm going to try to keep this in 12 minutes. If I go over a little, I apologize. I'll try my best to be on time. So starting with my theoretical approach, uh, before I actually get to that slide, let me just add something here. Uh, I'm looking around this room, this virtual room right now, and I see people from Africa, I see African Americans, and I see me, someone born in India. And one thing that kind of unites all of us is that all of us had our lives touched by colonialism, if you think about it. I mean, whether the colonialism happened recently or it happened in the previous century doesn't matter but the fact is that who we are is heavily shaped by colonialism and therefore that post-colonial mindset the post-colonial perspective does impact everything i do and i i i, I assume it's the same for um for a lot of you as well so having said that let's kind of proceed with this slide and so my research i mean like okay so Apart from that post-colonial uh, lens, I have a primarily critical approach to research and practice. And uh, as as Angela explained, I mean, there are various ways in which you can define critical theory. Uh, I see it basically as the practice that is oriented towards critiquing and changing society where versus merely understanding or explaining it. I mean, traditionally, when you look at scientists or social scientists, they try to dispassionately and objectively understand and explain phenomena, whereas critical theorists see what we do as inherently political and therefore they see a moral responsibility to critique and change society through their research and practice, if that makes sense. I also uh, espouse what can be called the Gramscian perspective, uh, named after the philosopher Gramsci, who basically believed that power relations lie at the heart of every aspect of society. Everything we do in our own families, in our, in our workplaces, in schools, everywhere, at the 
at the core of everything we do as human beings in society is power. And ruling classes everywhere at all times in human history have used cultural institutions to maintain their power. And if we see technology as a cultural institution, I mean technology also is used to maintain power or to take power away from people. Therefore, uh, I and a lot of other critical scholars see research and practice as acts and expression of our own privilege and our own power. That research and practice is not objective and neutral and dispassionate. The very act of picking a set of issues to study and the very act of choosing what kind of data we want to collect, all of that are acts and expressions of our own privilege and our own power. And uh, from a methodological perspective, uh, basically I prefer qualitative research methods, uh, mostly case studies. And the reason for that is because human culture, I mean, we talked about, I mean, in, in Angela's presentation, we talked about culture and what it means. Uh, culture is incredibly complex, as, 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 as we all understand. And uh, a lot of traditional quantitative post-positivist research methods involve isolating and manipulating variables. And that's something you really cannot do meaningfully in a cultural context, I believe, and therefore more holistic research methods like, you know, allow us to understand the complex phenomena that are, that, that make up culture better than experimental, quasi-experimental, or some of those other techniques. So case study, historical analyses, and content analyses are some of the, some of the methodological approaches that I have used. And uh, in, 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 in my own empirical research. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the historic roots of our field. I mean, history is everywhere, and history impacts everything we do uh, because the past makes us who we are. And uh, I talked about colonialism, and I talked about the post-colonial perspective. And uh, looking at our field, I mean, it's important to understand where our field comes from and uh, what its roots are. And so the roots and origins of the thinking and practice in our field of educational technology essentially lie in the military slash industrial sphere. Because if you look at where did the field originate, the primary reason for people to start thinking about using technology in education was after the Industrial Revolution when you had hordes of workers who had to be trained to start working in mushrooming new factories all over the Western world. And also, I mean, you had the Great Wars, you had World War I and II, and especially World War II in the US, when the US entered the war, suddenly you had all these recruits who had to be trained. And that is one of the first historical instances where there was a huge push to use technology to facilitate training of all these new recruits. And if you look at workers, if you look at military recruits, and if you look at the kind of interventions that were, that were created to train them, uh, it's very clear that these were aimed at a seemingly uniform target demographic. Now, whether that uniformity was just taken as a given or whether it is considered desirable or ideal, I mean, that's up, that's up for discussion. Uh, we, can, we could talk further about that at some other point. But the fact is that these people who were the target of those original technological interventions, they actually wore uniforms. I mean, the workers, the, the military recruits, they were predominantly young, able-bodied, and historically mostly white males. And therefore, I mean, is it surprising that at the origins of our field lie, lies this idea of one-size-fits-all performance solutions? Oh, you're a bunch of very, very similar people, and let's just have one common solution that fits everybody. I mean, and, 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 and like, you know, 
and diversity doesn't really matter, does it? And so uh, some of the other factors that basically helped in terms of erasing diversity as an issue was this idea that like you know in the name of nationalism in the name of company culture corporate culture that you actually wanted to impose uniformity you wanted to impose similarity and you actually wanted to get rid of differences because differences stood in the way of performance and so that deficit perception of diversity lies at the very heart of our field. It lies at the very basis of our field. And the founding fathers of our field actually did come out of this mindset. And I use the word fathers intentionally because, I mean, how many founding mothers do we have? Historically, the field is, the field originated off, for, and by white males. That's just how it is. And some of this original thinking, original sin, <laughs> still permeates mainstream thinking and practice in our field. Uh, in an ideal world, we wouldn't need to have a culture, learning, and technology division because every division should be able to incorporate cultural lenses and frames of reference in what they do. But because they don't, we need to have a special interest group like this. So, moving on, uh, once again, looking at this from a historical perspective, think about the information age. The information age is what we currently live in, and it was preceded by the uh, industrial age, and before that, the agricultural age, and before that, the pre-agricultural hunting gathering age, if you want to call that. So the information age basically saw the radical transformation of our workplaces and our societies by computers, the internet, and what I refer to as DMT, which for me is shorthand for digital media technologies, because that's basically what, what runs the world right now in the information age. And I don't know if, 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 if everyone in this room has heard about the concept of means of production. It, it comes out of Marxist thinking, and it's the, these are basically the resources and personnel that are required to produce goods and services in any economy, in any, in any socioeconomic system. And uh, traditionally, if you look at the industrial age, uh, ca factories were either owned by wealthy capitalists or by the state. And they literally had, therefore, a stranglehold over the primary means of production in an industrial age system. And what's happened now with the proliferation of digital media technologies is that that traditional control over means of production is getting diluted. It's getting democratized. And so now basically anybody with a computer and internet access could be their own boss, could be their own, like, you know, could, could be a business owner, an entrepreneur, an independent consultant, whatever they want to be. And so some of the benefits of the information age is this idea of a flattening world. I borrow that word from Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat, where he talks about how in the old days, for example, in order to do well, in order to participate in the stock market, you had to be physically present on Wall Street in New York City. Or in order to like, you know, be a software developer, you had to be in Silicon Valley in California. And that's no longer true. One of the reasons why India, the country of my origin, has become an information technology superpower right now is because of that flattening world phenomena. And that's led to the, the dissemination and the democratization of opportunities. So uh, it's no longer just in New York and California and Western Europe where economic growth is happening anymore. Uh, it's, 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 it's moved all over the world and, 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 and a lot of that is because of the information age and because of digital media technology. On the other hand, what's happening is that it is exacerbating the digital divide. The digital divide, which is the gap between those who have and don't have access to digital media technologies, those who know how to use them to emancipate and empower themselves and those who don't. And those who actually use, those who actually do stuff with technology to uplift themselves and those who don't. 
I, 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 I talked to my students about this incident at this local train station in Michigan where I used to live where these two older ladies showed up and they were trying to buy a ticket, a train ticket, and there was no way for them to buy one because the only way they could do it is to buy it online and have it printed out at home because there was no ticket counter at the train station. And they were lost. They were like, how do we get a ticket? So, I mean, I mean, just think about it. I mean, like a, for, for a lot of us, we just take it for granted that, oh yeah, we buy our tickets online. But there are people for whom that is a foreign concept. I mean, it's it's it's, it's kind of a like a, a, a very small example, but it just gives you the idea of, 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 of how the ubiquitous distribution of digital media technologies, how that is exacerbating these divides between those who have, know, and do, and those who have not, know not, and do not when it comes to technology. So in the meantime, what's been happening socially in the information age is that there is a lot more globalization and also a lot more transnational mobility. I mean, I was at this place called Ellis Island a few weeks ago, and Ellis Island is the National Museum of Immigration in America, and that's where a lot of immigrants came in, like, you know, 100 years ago or so. And uh, a lot of those people, it took them three to four weeks in a ship to get to, to America from Europe. And when I came to America in 1999, I just got into a plane and a few hours later I was here. And so uh, if you look at how much people travel and move these days, it's, it's, it's pretty unprecedented. I mean, there were previous waves of migration. I mean, during the time when the Americas and South Africa and Australia and these other colonies were, were settled, but in terms of just the magnitude of travel and, and who is able to travel, it's, it's unprecedented what's happening right now. And what all this leads to is more diversity. I mean, in the old days, you had diversity in New York and Los Angeles, and in the middle of the U.S. and Kansas, there was none. But right now, there's people like me in the middle of Kansas, in the middle of nowhere, literally. And so diversity is now becoming everybody's issue, not just the issue of big port cities and the coasts, so to speak. And our field, unfortunately, has been very slow to evolve in response to these socioeconomic transformations happening all around us. Thomas Schwen, who is a prominent, I mean now retired, uh, prominent performance technologist, and I was lucky enough to have him be my main advisor at Indiana University Bloomington where I got my doctoral degree. And Thomas Schwen had this favorite expression. He said, only recently have we as a field become proficient enough to do harm. Think about it. Only recently have we become proficient enough to do harm. And part of that harm is done when we don't evolve to take into account the fact that our target learners aren't uniform anymore. I mean, they were never uniform to begin with, but at this point, they definitely, most definitely are not. And so we need to get to the program. And that's the problem, that we have been very slow in getting with the program. So the article that I wrote, the chapter that I wrote for this book, it is actually a follow-up to an article I wrote back in 2004, and that was one of the first articles that basically named the problem, which is basically that our field as a whole is not paying attention to cultural diversity among our stakeholders. And that is a problem because, 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 and I, uh, and, and so this current chapter is a revisiting of the issues more than 10 years later from 2004 to 2017. I mean, so we're talking about like 13 years later. And to see like, you know, what has changed, what has stayed the same, and where do we go from here? And so when I talk about findings, I am talking about my current chapter, but I'm also talking about the previous, its, it's, it's previous iteration, its prequel, so to speak. And so one of the things that I found in 2004 and in 2017 is that cultural diversity 
is vastly underrepresented, vastly underrepresented in these scholarly publications, conferences, and graduate programs in our field. There is a growing group of reformist scholars, what I would call reformist scholars, scholars who want to change the status quo. And uh, for a long time, we gathered under the umbrella of minorities in media, which was the original grouping of scholars of color in this field. And minorities in media morphed into the culture of learning and technology division at AECT. And this book is an example of some of the work that this group of reformist scholars is doing to try to bring cultural diversity more to the forefront and more into the mainstream discourse in our field. However, the fact is that even today, even right now, cultural issues remain at the periphery of the mainstream discourse of our field. It is still special interest groups like CLT that are primarily dealing with cultural issues. Cultural issues still find themselves aired only in special issues or in special, like, you know, books like this one, the one that, that, that we all wrote together. It is still not integrated into the mainstream discourse of our field. And as long as that doesn't happen, we still have a problem. And what happens with that systemic inattention to cultural issues is that it exacerbates the digital divide and it harms the increasingly diverse population of stakeholders who are impacted by our practice. On the one hand, globalization and the spread of digital media technologies means that we as a field are impacting more and more populations around the globe that previously were not impacted by our research and practice. On the other hand, the West itself is getting more diverse as mobility allows more and more people to travel and move and settle in new areas. And so, and where is our field by, by, by not evolving, by still not paying attention to these issues, it exacerbates the problems. And one of the problems I talk about in my, in my writings is this vicious cycle of alienation. So on the one hand, you have some pre-existing issues. You have inadequate and inequitable access to technology among historically marginalized and, and underrepresented groups, cultural groups. They often also experience language and terminology barriers because the mainstream language of the field does not reflect who they are. And they also experience a lack of mentors and role models to exemplify the use of technology for emancipation, for uplift, for social mobility. And that's so this entire set of issues in those giant parentheses, I mean, these are pre-existing issues. And so when you add to it the inappropriate and inst insensitive instructional solutions that result from our field's lack of interest and attention to cultural issues. All that it does is it leads to further alienation from the emancipatory potential of technology for those groups that we talked about. And that goes back to exacerbate those pre-existing conditions. So we end up having a vicious cycle of alienation where groups who have not had a seat at the table in our field, so to speak, get further and further away from the emancipatory potential of technology, if that makes sense. So uh, one of the things that we were asked to do as part of this presentation is to talk about, like, you know, how could some of our perspectives, uh, how could they translate to contexts in Africa, since this is Emerge Africa? And so uh, I'm talking about post-colonial context in general, going back to that discussion I had at the beginning about the post-colonial view. And I see India, Africa, I see minorities in the United States, I see all of us basically as essentially being post-colonial people. And so I believe that these perspectives translate uh, pretty well in other post-colonial contexts, including Africa. 
you all tell me what you think. So on the one hand, power relations, I mean, using digital media technologies either to reinforce existing power structures or to subvert and dismantle them. That this isn't this is something I've talked about in my writings, and I believe this is something that also relates to situations in various sub-Saharan African countries where you have a divide between the elite and everybody else. And think about it, how is the elite using technology to maintain their privilege? And how are they using access to to technologies or the lack thereof to limit other people's chances for upward mobility. That's that's important to think that the power dimensions of technology access and use. The, 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 the digital divide, I mean, we have one here in the US, they definitely have one in India, and I'm sure they have one in, 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 in many African countries too. Uh, and so what are some of the local dimensions and ramifications or impacts of the digital divide. I think that is something that would be fascinating to, to discuss and to explore. We also need to see technocentrism, technocentrism, which is basically the idea that technology is the ideal solution to all of our social, educational, economic, and moral problems. Technocentrism can be also seen as a manifestation of neocolonialism because technocentrism is based on the idea that technology or other digital media technologies are culturally neutral and therefore they are applicable throughout the world among all cultures equally. But that's not true because any technology is embedded with the culture of its creator. So if you take a technology like, for example, interstate highways, freeways, expressways, motorways, whatever you call them in different parts of the world, the motorway or the freeway represents a certain worldview, a certain way of thinking that is inherently Western. And when you translate that into a non-Western country, what does it do to their culture? And I, I, and I got to observe that in India because India recently decided to build a countrywide interstate highway system like you know with western style highways and it is changing the landscape and culture of the country in ways that people never foresaw and so to give you like you know once again a concrete example consumers versus producers is it okay to be just a consumer of technology or is it important to make that step and become a producer and exporter of technology. Why is that important? Once again, it goes back to the, the fact that technology embeds the culture of their creator. And if you aren't creating technology, then your culture is not reflected in the technology that you use. I mean, these are these are huge connotations here. I'm trying to rush through them. And so I I apologize if this seems like really kind of like, you know, brief, but it's just, I mean, we have a time uh, we have a time constraint here. Once again, I mean, going back to the fact that, like, you know, that the mainstream discourse in our field is just so not diverse and how it does not reflect diverse perspectives, it is really important to bring African voices into our field's mainstream discourse. And I, I, I just love the idea of Emerge Africa and these webinars, and I would love to see more African voices in our literature so that the rest of us in the field can understand what's going on in Africa and understand perspectives from various African nations. And, and I mean, once again, I mean, the, the term Africa, it bothers me because a lot of people in the US and other countries, they think of, they, they, they think of Africa as being a country, which of course it's not, it's a continent and it is vastly diverse and different parts of Africa are, are as different from each other as different parts of Asia or any other continent in the world. And so uh, I think it's really important to bring more African voices into our field. And so I will end my presentation there. I know it's been really rushed and I know it's really been a little too brief. But no, it hasn't been rushed, Deepak. It's been great. It's been great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have... 
Nicola, we need some direction on how we should proceed. I think our time is up, and we have a third presenter. Do we, if Michelle can do it, do we have her come next week, or do we do, or do we try to do her presentation now? Because we're at the end of our one-hour period. So, what's your recommendation? Yes, I think if. It yeah, I think if uh, Lachelle, if, if next uh, the next uh, webinar suits you time-wise, uh, the other option is we could even have a third webinar in the series. Lachelle? Her mic is off. Yeah, so I think that we, we can keep in touch and then decide from there. Um, I do want to just say that we have one winner. Um, of one of your wonderful books, and it's Joseph uh, Wambu, who says that indigenous knowledge is very rich in terms of applicable skills, which complements what is learned formally. So Joseph, we'll get in touch with you. Um, the other colleagues, we'd like to remind you to please enter, if you would like to win an uh, e-book, uh, enter the competition. And don't forget to join the second webinar in the series, which is taking place on the 24th um, of this month. I hear folks are typing, Rochelle and Angela. Oh. That's you typing. Oh, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I thought I, was, I, I thought I was sending a message to Rochelle. And there may be a third no, session. Fine. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I think we, we can discuss um, what what might work for folks. Okay. But I think this is a really, really deep um, series on getting us all to think uh, more critically also about our own uh, positionality and how we can enhance the, what I, I said, you know, the epistemic diversity of the ed tech field. Um, yes, and thanks all for joining us today. And please... Continue the discussion on our Facebook um, event page. And if you have any relevant uh, resources you'd like to share, uh, please do so as well. And, and thanks to our um, US, uh, colleagues based in the US for joining, um, you know, making this time, because I know it's really, all, um, really early for you guys. So thank you so much. We appreciate it a lot. Any closing closing thoughts, Angela? Over to you. Oh no! Just thank you for having us this morning and uh, for being particip for participating with us earlier. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us. Nicola, how do we best do that? Do we do we just leave our email addresses? How do we? Sure, I think folks can contact us via the Facebook uh, group. Okay. Facebook, sorry, okay. Facebook page, and then we'll share your your email addresses. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for being here today. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nicola, Jacob, and Tony, and thank you to all the participants. I I I, I am honored to be here and uh, and to have this chance to to be with all y'all. And thank you once again. Um, this was really, really deep and very important. Um, yeah, and I'm going to hand over to Jakob now. But look forward to seeing you all again for the second uh, seminar in the series. Uh, have a great day further. Bye for now.